I'm wrapping up my sermon series on bad religion. There's too much bad religion in the world. To learn more, stay tuned for Reach Out and Live. Welcome to Reach Out and Live, a program of music, scripture, and sermon, brought to you each week by the many viewers and members of First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, my name's Jim. We're in Mark chapter 10. We have our wonderful Plymouth Choir, so let's worship together. And let us hear the scripture from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Let us pray. God of abundant love, we like to think that we have it all figured out that all we have to do is go to church and pray the right words, but that we don't really have to walk the walk. But we are just kidding ourselves. For you, O oh God, offer us new life full of compassion, joy, and peace. But it does require us to act and to walk that walk. Your call to us is simple but not easy. You call us to follow, but that means we must move. We must leave things behind, such as selfishness, greed, and complacency. You have invited us into ministries of peace and justice, but we must act. You have invited us to follow, but that means that we cannot turn our back on opportunities to, for service and witness. We must live out your transformative love with all that we say and do. Help us to listen and live into your words of hope. Remind us again that you require compassion and mercy in all who serve you, but also that you will guide our way. Give us courage to hear the simple call and to get up and to move so that we may stand up for mercy and justice, that we may speak with love and hope, and that our actions may be compassionate and bring peace for all people. Oh God, we pray all of this in the hope and promise of your love. Amen. There are obviously bad forms of religion, such as violent fundamentalism, doomsday cults, money-grubbing tele-evangelists, and plain charlatry. But in this new three-part series, I will be exploring the more subtle ways that religion can devolve into the silly and banal. So let's discern together what makes for a religion of deep goodness. What can we know for sure about the will of God? This, that God desires your fullness and flourishing. God's will is your well-being, the wholeness of persons. This we can know. I'm in a sermon series on bad religion. And bad religion, by definition, would be when religion does not align itself with God's will. When religion isn't honoring persons, souls, not helping make our souls more noble. 
Now, I'm not preaching on my pet peeves about religion. You know what a pet peeve is. It's those little irritants that get under your skin. They don't really matter, but they bug you. Well, I have pet peeves about religion. I mean, one is all the weird words in religion. They kind of bug me, like the word narthex. Narthex is that little area before the sanctuary, but to me it sounds like an anti-inflammatory drug. Honey, let's play tennis. Well, remember to take your narthex, you get really sore. Religion has tons of weird words. I don't like the word pew. It's just manifestly unappealing. <laughs> pew. I, I don't like the word columbarium. It sounds like something you have to drink before a procedure. There's a lot of weird words in religion. It's a pet peeve, but I'm not preaching about pet peeves. I've got them. Like, like I don't like the names of churches anymore. They're either oddly historical or way too trendy. Have you noticed this? So like oddly historical, First Congregational Church, First United Methodist, First Presbyterian Church, even First Plymouth, weird historical denominational names, or names that are trying to be way too hip, like Animate Church, Energize Church, Escalate Church, Pulse Church, Flow Church, Journey Church. I have pet peeves. I wish names of churches were just peaceful and real. I'm not preaching on pet peeves, although I just spent a couple moments. And I'm definitely not preaching on all the ridiculous rules in religion. Religion become, can become enamored with rules. I'm thinking of two right now that are pretty ridiculous. You know, in a Roman Catholic and a lot of Protestant churches, you can't take communion unless you're a member. Or same with baptism. They won't baptize someone, both Roman Catholic and Protestant churches, unless you're a member. And those, those rules seem like they're precisely against the very spirit of the sacraments, th their very meaning. Like, not to welcome people to take the Eucharist unless you're officially Roman Catholic or part of that Protestant church. In my mind, the Eucharist, a gathering with Jesus, in a spiritual sense, is all about an equality of souls, an egalitarianism, inclusion. It's the very spirit. And to set up rules like that of who can and who can't, it seems to violate its meaning. When I think about communion, my mind goes to the meals that Jesus had, all the meals he had during his ministry. It seemed to be a big part of his ministry to go to a village, gather people around a table, and a surprising mix of people, sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, Pharisees. He seemed to be purposely creating a type of equality of souls. In Mark 10, we heard one of those passages. Well, that frames my whole understanding of the Lord's Supper now, or the Eucharist. So can you imagine coming to the table of Jesus and being told, no, you can't, you're not a member here. That's a ridiculous rule. Or with baptism, you know, in the book of Acts and in other parts of scripture, baptisms happen when a, when a human heart desires to love Jesus, when a human heart desires to become Christian, to become part of this family of faith, at that moment of desire and will in Scripture, they'll baptize someone. But then we turn it, our ridiculous rules of religion, we turn it into an institutional matter. Oh, are you officially a member here? It skips over the very spirit of the sacrament to turn it into something institutional, a human being wants to be baptized. Religion can become encrusted with all these rules that don't make deep spiritual sense. Oh, I could preach a lot about that stuff. But I'm trying to focus on the deeper themes of bad religion, that which doesn't really honor the human soul, our flourishing. And in this last part of the series, I've got a few that I want to share. First, I want to talk about how religion can engage 
in groupthink. Groupthink is a term that was coined by William White in 1952, a sociologist, to describe that how in organizations or groups, sometimes there's such a desire for harmony and agreement and cohesion that, that a type of groupthink will take place and individual creativity or even individual responsibility is pushed to the side because what becomes so important is the cohesion of the group. I think we can see groupthink take place in religion. And when that does, we're not honoring personality, the individual. I've told you before that I come from a philosophical tradition called personalism. It considers the personality to be the central miracle of God's creation. The individual consciousness or soul, personality, that particular mixture of dreams and hopes and their will and their memories, personality. It's the central miracle. Now as a personalist philosopher, there is a hesitancy to ever put persons into categories because a person is an infinity. You can't put a person in a category. There's a hesitancy to ever treat a person like an object to be manipulated because a person is a subject. In fact, there's even a hesitancy in personalist philosophy to ever count persons. You can't count infinities. Now, I know our modern bureaucracies, our modern governments, they operate by statistics. You'll just see a lot of bean counting about human beings to make efficient decisions. But something is violated when a human being becomes a number. A soul is an infinity. And so in any way, when groupthink takes place in a religion, that individual personality and creativity is minimized, but it's precisely what we need to honor God. We need these idiosyncratic, different, unique perspectives. Religion shouldn't be about groupthink. It should be about each soul and the majesty and uniqueness of their soul coming to understand Christ and God in their way. In so many ways, we minimize personality. The most creative people, the most interesting perspectives are sort of pushed to the side. That's groupthink. Have you ever heard of Gresham's Law? Gresham's Law in economics, it just says bad money drives out good. It has to do that if you bring in a bad currency, like in 1964 in America, quarters and dimes were silver but then we brought in cheaper metals. So what happens, people begin to actually hoard the good currency, the silver, and only use the debased metal. It's just Gresham's Law talks about how in economics, bad money will drive out good money. Well, that can happen actually in religion. That if there's so much groupthink, bad groupthink, then the most creative individuals will no longer take part. Imagine this with me that maybe some of the most amazing particular opinions and hearts and souls that don't want to join in groupthink so they don't join in on religion. Think of what's lost. Maybe you're an oddball. Religion needs oddballs. Maybe you're an eccentric. A little bit weird, are you? Religion needs you. But groupthink ruins that. It's well, that's one of my, not just pet peeves, something that I think can be deeply bad about religion. Let me move to another bad element in religion. The way that we deal with scripture, it's called proof texting. The way Christians will already have an opinion and then they'll turn to scripture for a verse to simply support the opinion they already held. Proof texting. And it is done all the time. And it, it, it infiltrates itself enough in our religion that it is really bad. The Bible is to be an authority over our lives, not to be something that we bolster our opinions with. But again and again, both liberals and conservatives will look for a verse that supports them. And the strangest things can happen, things that aren't true to the spirit of the Bible, like if you take a verse that puts down a gay person or a being a woman or violence, 
you can support very strange things if you proof text putting down people. You remember WWJD? It was a bracelet people used to wear. This is way back. It's what would Jesus do? It was just a reminder for in their actions during the day, what would Jesus do? Well, we should wrap that bracelet around scripture and, and remember that if someone's trying to use a verse to put someone down, always think about, well, what would Jesus do? That spirit of Christ that should permeate our interpretations of scripture. Too much proof texting going on. Another bad element of religion comes to mind now. Have you noticed that religion has a tendency to segregate us ethnically? Surely you've noticed this. Our world is pretty segregated still among different ethnicities, but then it gets even worse in religion. Martin Luther King called the worship hour the most segregated hour in America. There's some tendency in religion that, that we almost want to be with people just like us. We want to be comfortable. And, and so somehow churches become more and more segregated. It's not good. It, it's bad. Take Lincoln. Lincoln is more white than the average town in America, almost 80% almost Anglo, and then about 6% Latino, about 5% Asian, about 4.5% African American and on, but Lincoln is a little whiter than the rest of the country, but then First Plymouth is a little whiter than Lincoln. Our own church, it's about 90% Anglo. Now why would this be? We follow the demographics across the board in every other respect. We follow the demographics on economic class. We have poor folks and wealthy folks and the whole diversity. We, we follow the demographics on religion. The biggest religions in Lincoln are Roman Catholic and Lutheran, and most of our members come from the Roman Catholic or Lutheran tradition at First Plymouth. We follow the demographics but not around ethnicity. Why is that? Why primarily do Anglos worship with Anglos? Blacks worship with Blacks, Latinos with Latinos, Asian with Asian. Why does religion become even more segregated? I don't have an answer, but I, I have a vision that religion should be the place where we become less segregated. That's my simple vision. Why isn't it so? I don't have an answer, but in some way it's because we're not faithful enough, that I'm not faithful enough. Why are we more segregated? That's bad. And then lastly, as this series ends, I want to remind you of the meaning of the word gospel. It's one of the great words in our tradition. Now, sometimes when you say gospel, you're referring to the four gospels in our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But other times, like with the Apostle Paul, when he uses the word gospel, he means this entire vision of the Christian faith, the, the life and ministry, death and resurrection and teachings of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the word gospel can mean the, the whole kerygma, the whole content of our faith. But the word gospel originally in Greek simply means good news. In fact, it's intriguing how we took this word into our tradition. Gospel in Greek or the good news is what Caesar Augustus would put forth in an edict. You would get the gospel of say Caesar's birth or, or some other proclamation, the good news. So Caesar would put out a gospel, a, a, a declaration of some good news for the imperial reign. But then the Christians took over that word to not be talking about Caesar, but about the good news of Jesus. It was a wonderful act of subversion to take edicts from the empire and then bring it into this, this little people's movement. I want you to remember that basic meaning of gospel today, that it's good news the good news of liberation and hope and fulfillment and flourishing, the good news of love. You see, we're embedded in bad news these days. 
Every, there's so much bad news. And then even religion itself can perpetuate just bad news. Religion could become moralizing and puritanical. We need to remember that we're about good news, not bad news. The good news of hope, of love. So religion is bad when it loses that sense of joy and positivity. And there is so much religion that has lost the positive. The good news, the gospel. H.L. Mencken. Do you know that name? He was a great satirist. He used to write about Puritans or the puritanical attitude that could infect all of religion. He defined a Puritan as someone who has the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be having fun. He saw a puritanical attitude that would infiltrate all of religion and then religion would become something dour and grim and sour and a little mean. But religion is supposed to bring a joy and positivity. We are a people of the good news. We have so much bad news around us. I feel like we swim in bad news. It's religion that's supposed to be good news, full of joy and positivity. Jesus said, I have come so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be full. We are people of the good news. I'm ending my sermon on bad religion, reminding us of gospel. We are to be that light of hope and joy and positivity. People need the gospel. You need the God, I need the gospel, the good news. Amen.
it's wonderful that we could worship together. Do you know you could join our worship services live every Sunday morning on YouTube, Facebook, or our website, and all of that is made possible by friends like you and the members here at First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. If you believe that an open-minded, loving congregation can help change the world, then consider making a donation. It will help us increase the love of God and neighbor, both in Nebraska and the world. If you would like to learn more about our church, go to firstplymouth.org. You can watch videos of the sermons, learn about our many programs and missions, then follow us to Facebook and become a friend. We now worship online at 9 a.m. and 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, and our website. We also add live events, so join us online. I didn't share it, but one of my pet peeves about religion is how the word just made its way into every Christian prayer. We just pray Jesus, or I just pray for this. This just somehow became a common word. I don't like it, it's a pet peeve, but now I want to use it. I just hope this week will be a graceful one for you, and you can bear the light to others, and then we can all reach out and live. Tune in again next week for another edition of Reach Out and Live.